four people here. So hello everyone, I'm uh, Margaret Hask, I'm director of the Cornwall Library and welcome to this very exciting event with Simon Winchester and Jane Garmy. They will be talking about Ms. Winchester's newest book, Land, How the Hunger for Ownership Shaped the Modern World. Uh, a couple of housekeeping notes, as you see, we have had to mute you because we have such a large group. Um, uh, so if you have a question or comment, we've allowed some time at the end and please use the chat feature. We will be monitoring that and, and we'll make time if there are a lot of questions or comments. Um, and also, um, if, if you're able to, we would like to request a donation to the library. It, it keeps these kind of events going, keeps them funded and um, we're, we're loving all of our Zoom programming. I hope you are too. Um, and um, Mr. Winchester has made arrangements with the Kent House of Books uh, for um, signed and even inscribed copies. If you're interested, um, Shari will be putting um, that information up on the chat um, early on and then again later on. And if you still have trouble with it, if you email me, I'll get back to you within a couple of days and, and we'll make arrangements uh, for you to get a book. Um, so Jane Garmy has arranged this event for us. Jane is from Cornwall. She's a noted garden writer, the author of City Green, Public Gardens of New York, The Writer in the Garden, Private Gardens of Connecticut, Private Gardens of the Hudson Valley, and Great British Cooking, A Well-Kept Secret, as well as Great New British Cooking. And like Winchester, Garmy is a British transplant. And Jane has been just a wonderful friend to the library, very supportive and active in our programming. So, Mr. Winchester, thank you. Jane, thank you so much. Are you ready to get started? Uh, thank you. Um, well, Simon, I want to thank you so much for giving up a Saturday afternoon to be with us. We're, we're really thrilled to have you. Um, and my problem is I hardly know where to begin. Not only are you, um, I'm about to heap praise on you. Not only are you the author of, um, by my count, 17 books, um, many of them bestsellers and probably best known to everyone, your, uh, the, the Professor and the Madman, which is the absolutely riveting history of, the, of how the Oxford English Dictionary came into being. But, uh, and, and of course, your latest book, um, which we're gonna talk about today, Land, um, uh, the, uh, the how, it's got the longest subtitle, How the Hunger for Ownership Shaped the Modern World. But first of all, you've also had an incredible life, and I think I have to let everybody know. Uh, um, after, after leaving Oxford, where you, had a, you got a degree in geology, and having just sort of merely hitchhiked around Canada and, and America before you'd even gone to Oxford, uh, you set off on a career you end up in uh, Uganda looking for copper for a Canadian company. Um, you, uh, you switch gears pretty soon and uh, decide you want to become a journalist reporter. And for the next, for, for, for many years, you work <coughs> for a number of newspapers, including The Guardian. And you travel and live all over the world. You reported in... Um, in, in Belfast, in Ireland, you were in Calcutta, New Delhi, Washington DC and the Argentine, where uh, actually you had the misfortune to be arrested and a prisoner for three months during the invasion of the Falklands. Um, and then in Hong Kong, where I read to my amazement, you traveled the length of the Yangtze River. Um, I don't know how many people know here yeah, know how long that took or how long it was. Um, but then finally, in 1997, uh, you you come you you come to America, you come to live in America, come to live in New York, and then uh, this is where your book begins. Actually, in 1999, uh, you purchase a piece of land in Amenia, New York, which is very close to all of us who live in Cornwall. And that is actually how your book opens. And I wonder if you can go into it a little because you certainly waited a long time to write the book. And um, being also uh, myself, uh, an emigre from England, I, you, you describe wonderfully that moment when you actually sign the contract and own a piece of America. So can you kind of take us from there to how you got to writing uh, Land? Indeed, and thank you very much indeed. What a lovely introduction. And oddly enough, Cornwall plays a, 
no small part in my uh, the reason I came to to settle in this part of the world because when I was in the closing months of British Hong Kong, it ceased to be a British colony on June the 30th, 1997. Um, my, the New York Times uh, correspondent, a chap called Larry Zuckerman, um, and I were talking one day in the FCC, the Foreign Correspondents Club, where I should go when I left Hong Kong. Should I go back to Britain or should I go to America where I'd been a correspondent quite a lot? And he said, I think if you like the English landscape, but you like the American spirit of get up, you know, get up and go and so forth, go and live in New England. My parents, he said, live in a place called Cornwall, Connecticut. So why not come over there and stay with them for a couple of weeks and wander about and see if you like it? And so I did and um, absolutely adored Cornwall and um, decided in the end, I bought a little cottage in Wasaic, which is part of Armenia, which is notable, at least to me anyway, as being the site of the first um, condensed milk factory in America, made by Borden's, I think. And I bought this cottage and in 1996, before the handover, and then once I left Hong Kong, went to live in it. And then the gentleman that hunted the land surrounding it told me one day that um, he was rather bored with paying the taxes and he only came up to hunt three or four times a year. He was a plumber who lived in, in the Bronx and would I like to buy it? And the price was eminently affordable. So I said, yes. And I bought this land, which to be honest was beautiful, but useless for doing anything with insofar as it was the, the north slope of a mountain. Um, and uh, I would walk on it and there were streams and lots of you know, attractive trees and all kinds of animals and so forth, but I could never really do anything with it. And I had this vague fantasy of ultimately having flatter land and uh, having an animal or two. And ultimately I, I bought a house that was on flatter land up here in the Berkshires where I'm speaking from now and sold the house but kept the land and I'm not quite sure why, but why became more apparent in 2011 when I became a citizen of this country. And um, the oath, you know, swearing the oath was extremely moving to me and it was done on the, the after deck of the USS Constitution in Boston Harbor. And um, I suddenly realized that all of a sudden, I was quite literally, insofar as I owned 130 acres of America, I was fully invested in the country that I was now a citizen of. I never really owned any land anywhere. And I began to think, what does ownership really mean? And so I would come to the land and instead of simply walking and looking at the trees and so forth, I started doing research on who had owned it before me. Obviously I knew that because I'd bought the land for him, from him. But then going to Poughkeepsie and the, you know, the, where the records of Dutchess County land uh, are kept and watching as the, as the deeds went back and back and back in history. And of course, in recent times, they were typewritten. And then before that, they were typeset and printed and then handwritten. And then if you go further and further back, handwritten, not in English, but in Dutch. And the, the people from whom the land was acquired by these Dutchmen, no longer seemed to write in any known language or not to me anyway. And they would affix their signs with an X or a little sketch of a deer or a sheep or some kind of animal. And I realized that these were Mohican Indians. And I then began to do a bit of research on them and realized that their attitude to the land was that while they superintended it, and while they hunted it and the practice agriculture on it and so on and so forth, they never considered that they owned it properly. And so this idea that in on this one piece of land in Dutchess County, New York, um, the transition from superintendence to non-ownership to ownership and then ownership by me seemed to be something interesting. So I put it to my editor, a lady in, in obviously New York City, 
And she said, yes, a wonderful idea to explore what ownership means, but don't restrict it to the United States. Let's have a look at ownership all over the world. And so um, I was able to, before, if you remember the pandemic, what it was like traveling. So I went all over the place to I mean, New Zealand and Australia, but to India and China and uh, all over Europe and Russia and try and get some sort of picture of what ownership meant in all of these various countries. So it all began crucially with my becoming a citizen and realizing that becoming invested in the country that I was a citizen of had a sort of a spiritual aspect to it, which I'd never really considered before. Um, well, that's, that, that, that's fascinating. And um, uh, your book uh, is, is just huge because it does. It, it not only covers, um, uh, I think, every certainly every continent and a great deal of countries, it goes back in history, and um, which is fascinating. And I wondered if you could talk a little uh, about uh, the curious custom in England of beating the barns and how that dates back to one of the, uh, the you know, the, the earliest uh, the earliest forms of ownership. Yes, well, the whole business of, of borders, I find absolutely fascinating. I mean, what do we think was the first border anywhere? Um, obviously, international borders, that's slightly different, and perhaps we can talk about that in a moment. But um, consider, and, and let's think of England, because you and I know England, and it applies to most of the rest of the world, as it happens. Think of Bronze Age farmers, let's say two of them farming them, probably know each other, neighbors, maybe relatives. And one is farming, practicing early agriculture on the flatlands in a river valley. And his friend, maybe a quarter of a mile away up on a hillside. And we're talking Bronze Age, so five 5,000 years ago. Though the agricultural equipment is very primitive, a, a thing, thing called a kashrom, which is an, a fire-hardened stick, main, mainly tipped with bronze or some kind of metal to make it more um, sturdy. And it goes without saying, I mean, you use it to dig a hole and you put a seed in and you water it and a plant comes out and then you do it in a line and that's a furrow and you produce a lot of plants and that produces crops that you can eat or sell or whatever. And the idea of furrows suddenly becomes a component of early agriculture. So you have this Farmer A on the flat countryside producing, let's say, north south furrows, parallel lines, and his chum over to the right, because he's on the side of a hill, his furrows, let's say, follow, follow the contours. And so there is an angle to the north south furrows of farmer A. And at some point, they meet each other like that, rather like the ripples when you throw two pebbles into a pond, they intersect. Well, where they intersect, these two farmers presumably put a line of sticks or wattles or stones or dug a trench or something which would have delineated, demarcated farmer A's land from farmer B's land. And that in theory would have been the first border, wouldn't necessarily depict ownership, but it would signify superintendence. Well, that would eventually, they would transmute into borders, yes, between individual farmers, and then individual villages, individual communities, individual counties or prefectures. And certainly when I was a boy, I grew up in, in, in at least one of the periods of my life, in a village in Dorset, in Southwest England. And the boundaries of that village had been known for hundreds of years. I mean, this particular village, the church, was Norman, which meant it was sort of 10th century. Um, so that church had stood there for a thousand years, and therefore the border was of the, the boundary of this little town. And so every, I think sometime around Ascension Day, if I remember, sometime around now, springtime, the vicar of the church would gather all the old timers and crucially schoolboys like me. And the old man would have sticks. It sounds sort of Slightly, slightly creepy, but it didn't sound creepy to me back then. 
and they would wander around the borders, the ancient borders of this town, pointing out where it was. And when you came to a, a boundary stone that marked rather like blazes on the Appalachian Trail, where the, the border changes direction, they would pick up a boy like me, I was presumably quite small in those days, lift me up so that my head was downwards and bang me gently, but no firmly on the boundary stone so that I would always remember where the boundary of the village was. And this certainly instilled in all of, we were choir boys or altar boys or something, all of us we knew and one hoped would pass on to our successors where the boundaries of this little village were. So to English villagers, boundaries were important. And of course, they're hugely important today, not just in villages and prefectures, but between countries. And I often wonder, and I will stop being boring in a minute about this, but it fascinates me. Where do we think the first international frontier in the world was? If you accept humankind began in Ethiopia and all that. And then we have these sort of centers of population in the Nile Valley, in Mesopotamia, in the Indus Valley, in the Yellow River Valley in China. And the civilizations that are centered there spread outwards like penicillin mold in a Petri dish, where they intersect, where one group of people meet a completely different group of people of which they're totally unfamiliar. They're linguistically different, they're ethnically different, they, they look different. Where were the first groups to meet? And I think that probably the Nilotic people, in other words, the Arabs from the Nile, met the Mesopotamians from the Tigris and Euphrates valleys, probably near the city of Basra in Eastern Iraq, where the Marsh Arabs live to this day. And I think that is probably the first ethnic and consequently international border anywhere in the world. It's a long way from Burroughs in Wiltshire, but it's essentially a continuum. And it fascinates me to this day. Um. Well, and a lot of your book is, is fascinating. It's about, uh, in order to draw boundaries, one needs maps. So a certain amount of the book, you talk about map making, which is fascinating. And, um, but I think what your book is filled with a lot of depressing, very depressing facts. And um, for instance, maybe you can talk a little about uh, uh, um, a, a, a Pre, a, a very unknown British civil servant called Cyril Radcliffe, who had the misfortune to know uh, Lord Louis Mountbatten. And, uh, uh, well, you should tell the story, not me. It's, uh, it's a tragic, it's, tragic story, really. So it's 1947, um, high summer, and um, the British government decides to give India its independence. And they, they Lord Wavell, leaves and is replaced by the former supreme commander of allied forces in the east and a relative of the royal family lord louis mountbatten this grand figure comes to delhi with with his wife and um settle into the gigantic um viceroy's palace in delhi i don't know if you've ever been there but the number of staff is unimaginable they had 42 men whose sole purpose was to run around in the garden scaring away the birds. So you can imagine what a gigantic apparatus British rule of India was. Well, Lord Louis was given the task of giving independence to India and he set up an extraordinarily sort of rigid timetable. They must get it by the middle of August, 47. And everything was going relatively swimmingly. He wanted India to be given its independence as one country, as did um, the Mahathir um, Gandhi. But Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the leader of the Muslim League, said no. The Muslims need their own homeland. And he absolutely put his foot down. We must create two new countries, one in the West, in the Punjab, one in the East, in Bengal, and call them Pakistan. It's an acronym, Punjab, Afghanistan, Kashmir, Istan. And in the end, Mountbatten had to accept that this was a reality because the alternative was too murderous to contemplate. And so he said, right, well, we don't have very long. We've got about six weeks to create a new country. And that new country has got to have a frontier. And let's, for the purpose of this discussion, only talk about 
West Pakistan, the division of the Punjab. He got on the telephone and rang up this amiable Welsh civil servant, a man of tremendous rectitude uh, called Sir Cyril Radcliffe or Cyril Radcliffe in those days and said, and Radcliffe had never been, certainly never been to India. In fact, had never been east of Paris and said to him, come over here and with your fountain pen and a bunch of maps we'll give you and a couple of assistants, draw a border between Pakistan and India and you've got to do it quickly. And Cyril Radcliffe came over and went up into the hills to a relative cool, because this was high summer, of course, the town of Simla, and with four assistants, who it turns out all hated each other, and wouldn't speak to each other, and with a bunch of maps that were woefully out of date, and with some demographic data showing how many Muslims and how many Hindus lived in the various villages along the putative boundary line, he was told to take out his fountain pen and through these maps, draw a line 1700 miles long, which would be the new border of the new country. And he labored mightily. And finally, just a few days before independence on the 15th of August, 1947, he presented the maps and said, there we are. That is the division that I've drawn between West Pakistan and India. And the moment it was announced, so hundreds of thousands of Muslims who lived in India, fearing for their lives in a Hindu dominated India, fled westwards over this line, to Pakistan, and hundreds of thousands of Hindus who were in cities like Karachi and Islamabad and Peshawar in what was now Pakistan, fearful for their lives, rushed the other way into the supposed safety of India. Stirred into the mix were another few hundred thousand Sikhs who lived around the city of Amritsar. And these three groups of people killed each other in huge numbers. I mean, the number still to this day is, is not known, but it's reckoned to be somewhere like two million people. And you'll have seen television pictures of trains being stopped and Muslims being pulled out and slaughtered on the spot and, and vice versa. It was terrible, terrible carnage, the beginning I mean, an awful, awful birth for, for India. And um, so Cyril Radcliffe, who felt himself personally responsible for having created what he called this bloody line, um, left India immediately and went back to the peace and fact of London. He refused to take a penny piece for his works. He burned all his notes, though people like me have never known what he truly felt about it. And there's a short and sweet and very poignant film about him now an old and broken man living in somewhere in, in the Cotswolds, turning on the radio and listening to a poem that W.H. Auden had composed about this tragic act. So Sir Phil Radcliffe, to me, one of the sad, unknown, forgotten figures of, of history. And the irony was well, not an irony, really. I mean, I, when I first went to live in India, I drove my car from Oxford, where I was living at the time, to Delhi. Next, you could do that. It was just back through Europe and then Greece, Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan, which was an easy country to drive through then, over the Khyber Pass, through Pakistan, across the border. There's only one crossing point, a place called Wagga, Amritsar, and then get down to Delhi. Simple journey. And the Indian customs, um, I was driving a Volvo. They said, if you keep your car in India for more than six months, you have to pay 250% of its new value in customs tax. So the only way to evade this is every six months, you drive to Pakistan and for a day and then come back into India. So I used to know that border terribly well. Nowadays, it is the most bizarre border crossing imaginable. And I urge anyone with access to YouTube, look up WAGA, W-A-G-A-H, border crossing ceremony, because every night at six o'clock, soldiers from Pakistan, the tallest soldiers imaginable, members of the Pakistan Rangers, Indians, tallest soldiers imaginable from the Indian Border Security Force, all sort of executing bizarre marches like John Cleese in Ministry of Silly Walks, their legs, they look like the New York Rockets, 
marching towards each other, full of fury and anger, up to the line. And then moustache to moustache, they salute each other, take hands, and underneath there's Sir Cyril Radcliffe's line between their shined boot caps. And then they salute each other, slam the gates shut, and the border is closed for another night. But it's just an indication of, once again, how fascinating border lines are. So I should say, in conclusion, the India-Pakistan border now is so secure, so lit with arc lamps, that it is one of the most obvious things to be seen from the International Space Station at night, 1,700 miles from, from the sea right up into the Himalayas, drawn by this poor, forgotten civil servant, Sir Cyril Radcliffe. Well, it's it's, uh, it's a story that that repeats itself in your in your book. In uh, uh, there's you, you have the story about the Palestinian border. Um, you also um, uh, your book makes us very much aware of the injustices uh, done by governments and and people. And one thing that was a revelation to me was the. Um, uh, was the treatment during the internment of the Japanese farmers in Oregon. I've known that many Japanese were interned after Pearl Harbor, but you actually have a much worse story. And um, I, I, after this, we'll get on, I think we should, we'll look to the future and maybe see some better stories, but I'd love you to tell that story of uh, uh, Amiri Amaki, Amar Amaraki, and uh, what happened to him and to so many Japanese, because it it's, um, and, and one thing I should say is what, you tackle these huge subjects, but one of the things I love about your writing is that uh, you come to it as a journalist and as a reporter, and within this huge, sometimes overwhelming, uh, uh, these, these subjects you take on, you you have stories of individuals, and this is a particularly telling one within the book. So could you talk about it a little? Yes, I, I'm happy to. I mean, the, the man is called Akira Aramaki and he was a strawberry farmer from Bellevue in Washington state. One of 120,000 uh, people of Japanese um, ethnicity, a large number of them were American citizens, but 70% um, of those 120,000 were American citizens. On the orders of FDR, President Roosevelt, this infamous Executive Order 9066, they were ordered in early 1942, February 1942, to be rounded up by the army and put into 10, the, 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 the terminology is, is contentious and controversial. They were actually originally called concentration camps and then um, that term became loaded and they became for a long time internment camps. I don't mean to get sort of too technical about this, but they weren't interned. They were actually put into what are now once again being called concentration camps. And there were 10 of them, two in Arkansas, two in Arizona, two in California, and one each in Wyoming, um, Utah, and uh, Idaho, and um, the oh, and Colorado. And they were bleak and horrible places. And these people had a, a ghastly time. And they were finally released with $25 and a bus ticket back to their places of origin uh, when the war was over effectively in 1945. And many of them who had been farmers, this is the point I want to make about this, um, they found that the land one way or another had been taken away from them. So they lost not only their liberty, but also their land or no good reason at all. None of them had committed any crime at all. It was simply anti-Japanese racism. But the point I tried to make in the book and which I, I want to make here by, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to read a short portion of this, um, is that it really didn't have an awful lot to do with Pearl Harbor. That's, you know, people think, oh, well, Pearl Harbor happened, so better lock these people up. And there's an infamous cartoon by Dr. Seuss, if you remember Dr. Seuss, showing lots of sort of caricature Japanese with teeth and spectacles carrying packages of dynamite. Um, there was none of that. I mean, these 120,000 were essentially innocent. The reason why they were loathed was because they were so good at managing the land that they had. Let me just read this. Japanese 
farmers in America had formed. By that I mean British way of saying they had a reputation. Japan at the time was still an overwhelmingly agricultural nation with small holdings clustered in the fertile plains and a population well versed in the practices of small scale farming. Not for the Japanese, the business of managing waving prairie fields of golden grain. Back home, it was small rice paddy farming that dominated, as well as the growing of root vegetables for pickling or the green leafed legumes that were both so central to the local diet and so restorative to the local soil. All of these growing skills they brought to the American West and by doing so helped transform the local agricultural scene while propelling the Western states into the vanguard of the nation's food producers. However, the land that the Japanese were legally able to buy back then, just like the stump filled barons of Bellevue, they basically were hired to clear the stumps for the railroads, was generally marginal land, much of it flawed with poor quality soils, generally disdained by the existing white farmers. The newcomers encountered all manner of natural adversity, blight, floods, locust invasions, near starvation, but in a singular fashion, they managed to come through them all to the astonishment, admiration, and envy of many of the white farmers nearby. Yet envy can and did have poisonous consequences. A significant number of these white farmers fell prey to the burgeoning phenomenon of anti-Asian racism, the kind of thing we're seeing today. Bodies like the Asiatic Exclusion League and the Native Sons of the Golden West together with lawmakers from both main political parties, tried to put a crimp on the agricultural efforts of the immigrant Japanese. And yet the Japanese managed to come through it all, hardworking, determined, united, and generally optimistic. The statistics say much. In 1920, there were three and a half million people living in California, of whom some 71,000 were ethnically Japanese, 2% of the population. They managed to produce, however, fully 12% of California's total farm products, crops valued at some $67 million. By 1941, on the eve of war, their share of the truck farming crop of the Western states had risen to an astounding 42%, even though they were still at no more than 3% of the population. Japanese farmers working on holdings that seldom exceeded 40 acres produced 90% of the American West's snap beans, celery, peppers and strawberries, 25 to 50% of the area's asparagus, cabbage, cantaloupes, carrots, lettuce, onions, and watermelons. They had 30,000 acres laid to grapes, as well as 19,000 acres of plums, peaches, apricots, cherries, and almonds. They raised chickens in great abundance, and to top it all, they had control of some 65% by value of the flower market. And all of this was being raised and grown on the least fertile land in the States, a reality that as supporters of the Japanese farmers were quick to point out, kept the prices of all of these goods down for the ultimate benefit of the Western state consumer. But supporters of Japanese in those interwar days were vanishingly few in number, and the drumbeat of opposition was growing steadily. Rival white farmers were now facing competition like never before, and bodies that represented them, the Farm Bureau Federation, as well as a national fraternal organization called the Grange, did their level best to head off the Japanese challenge. The Los Angeles County Farm Bureau lobbied the government to retract Japanese rights to lease, rent, and own not just farmland, but any land whatsoever. So you can see that there was a tremendous, before FDR signed EO 9066, which put them all in prison. Um, you can see that they were loathed but because they were good at their job. And I think it's a common misperception, which I hope this book will go some small way to remedying, that it was purely because of Pearl Harbor that they were locked up. They weren't. It was because they were so good at farming the land. And then, of course, you go into when they came back, when they're released, their land has been appropriated and taken uh, uh, by the neighbors who, uh, many of whom refused to give back the land, some of whom were taken to court, others never were. It's a tragic story. It's um, a tragic story. And if you, I don't mean to drop, but I mean, they were, they had their 
before they even went to the prison camps, they had had their bank accounts frozen. And so they couldn't pay their taxes, among other things. And so back in the peace of wherever they were, Stockton or but Bellevue, the local authorities quite reasonably took a tax lien on their lands and eventually sold them. No. So they came back to nothing. Um, moving uh, to, uh, to more recent times, uh, I, I know we don't have that much time. Uh, I was fascinated, you talked about the two sort of very distinct experiments in something called wilding, uh, one with disastrous results in Holland, the other one I think uh, uh, still, still to be determined how successful it is, but that really led into a whole discussion on your part of, of, you know, there is now some understanding that ownership involves stewardship and I, I just wondered, so that people aren't too depressed, because there are many, many depressing stories in, in, in your book, and many extraordinary facts. By the way, does, is Queen Elizabeth still the landest, largest landowner in the world? Without uh, a doubt, but absolutely. Anyway, it, it, to, sorry to digress a moment. To, if, you could, uh, if you could talk a little about um, um, some of the more propitious mo movements that are going on now. I mean, certainly in Cornwall, uh, land conservation and land preservation is something that many of us are, I, I think, more and more interested in and more and more convinced how, of the importance of this. But could you talk a little about it from a larger perspective? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad you brought this up. And I'm sorry if you're somewhat depressed by the book. I, I think there are many good stories about it, and not least the whole business about the creation of new land in southern Holland, which I love that story. But yes. we can talk um, about that. On another occasion, maybe, but no, the the, the business of uh, of owning land and keeping it for yourself is, for me, wrongheaded, alien, if you like. Uh, and this was the belief of, I mean, the famous quotation is from Chief Steele, the man who was compelled in the eighteen sixties to sell land to build the city name for him, Seattle to this day. But he said, he essentially scratched his head and I, why do you want to buy this land? I mean, I don't own it. Why do you feel you, you can no more own the land than you can own the breeze or own the ocean? The land is your mother. You look after your mother and she'll ultimately look after you. That's the way nearly all Native Americans have regarded it, the land and that's the way the Aboriginals do in Australia and the, the Maori in New Zealand. Ownership is alien, yet the big landowners, I mean, the biggest landowner in the world, uh, leaving the Queen aside, private landowner is an Australian woman called Gina Reinhardt. Most of the land she owns is for mining, for ripping things out of it. And then in America, Ted Turner and John Malone, both, uh, as you well know, cable television uh, moguls. But then this extraordinary couple of evangelical Christians from West Texas called the Wilkes brothers, who mm -hmm. made a gigantic fortune about 10 years ago when they set up a, a fracking company, which in itself I find a pretty disagreeable way of earning a living, um, which was then bought out by the Singapore Several Sovereign Wealth Fund for $4 billion, meaning these two young men had two billion, not million, but billion dollars to play with. And they went on an a shopping spree for land in the Western states, Wyoming, Idaho, Montana. Um, and immediately, even though that land for many decades had been effectively, even though privately owned, available to everyone to go skiing or snowshoeing or walking on or fishing, they closed it all off. They said no, remembering of course that barbed wire is an invention of an American of British origin called Glidden, and that the whole idea of Trespass is essentially an American idea that we hold our land and no one can come on it. Whereas in Scandinavia, say, the, the, the local ethos is Almansratten. Everyone has the right, no matter that the land may be owned privately. Every Swede, every Norwegian, Finn, Dane, and currently Scott can wander as long as he behaves himself, doesn't dig holes or set fires. He has the absolute right in law to wander over that land at will. It seems to me eminently sensible. 
for this idea of communal ownership of land or communal access to land is mercifully growing and particularly here in the Northeast. And uh, I don't know the situation in Cornwall, but my own land, these hundred odd acres in Dutchess County, I am giving at a certain number of acres per year to the Dutchess Land Conservancy. I'm giving the conservation easement, which means that I can't develop that land and no one will develop it in the future. Anyone can have access to it and it will be superintended in perpetuity by a non-profit organization, the Dutchess Conservancy. And it's happening not here in Sandersfield where I live, but in New Marlborough, the next village to me, in Monterey, the village beyond that, on the way to the Great Barrington. It's pockets of Vermont are being looked at in this way, pockets of Maine, pockets of New Hampshire. And I think this is a, a tremendously uh, constructive approach to the future of land ownership in this country. What is happening in the West is still, in my view, archaic, unfair, and wrong. What's happening here in the Northeast seems to me revolutionary, um, suitable, and good for the land and good for the people that live on it. So long may the Northeast rule. Um, uh, thank you. And um, uh, there's so much else to touch on. Talk a little about the two, the wilding, uh, the experiment in Holland, because it's an, it's it's such an interesting idea and that, that is being talked about so much at the moment. Well, the, the situation in Holland, I found interesting for another reason. This was that part of the, the, the middle of Holland or the, uh, the Netherlands, the Low Countries, was an inlet of the North Sea, or the Zyder Sea. That was dammed off in the 1920s, and what had hitherto been a body of seawater became a lake called the Isselmeer, and it became ultimately fresh water. And then the Dutch, eminently sensible and needing more room, decided to build a, dams to make about a one million acre um, part of the sea, which they would drive with enormous pumps lifting the water out. It took about 15 years. Eventually, what had been water became mud. They flew aeroplanes over it, loaded with reed seed. The reeds grew, they set fire to it. Ash was created. They sowed grass on top of the ash. They created soil and the soil firmed up. They were able to walk on it build roads on it, build railways, build the city. And then they had a million acres of land, which they could then distribute. Um, no, tread of, no drop of blood had ever been um, shed in the creation of this land. No battles had been fought over it. So this is sort of honestly one land. And um, so they apportioned it. They put advertisements in the papers in Rotterdam and Amsterdam and The Hague, saying anyone that wants this land can rent it for 10 years for virtually nothing. And if you make a success, as Jefferson would have approved, of course, if you can improve the land, then you can buy it. And in 60 acre lots. And the only thing we will say is that we're going to have the demographic makeup of this new land, which is called Flavo land, um, reflect the demography of Holland or the Netherlands as a whole. So of the applicants, 30% will be Catholic, 30% Protestant, 30% members of the Dutch Reformed Church, 10% other. And that has worked out as a tremendous success. It's flat, boring, crime-free, modern, but it all works perfectly well. And the farms are bustling and producing a lot of crops for the Danish public and indeed for export. But they segmented off a part of it, which they said is going to remain wild. And that turned out for reasons of zoology and weather to be a disaster because all the wild animals started eating each other and people going past on the newly built railway train would see starving horses and vultures and things and found it very disagreeable and start throwing hay over the fences which is highly illegal and um, there was an outcry and the Dutch government abandoned the scheme but nonetheless the idea of wilding artificial wilding then spread to England and to a couple Charlie Burrell and Isabella Tree, who live in a castle about, uh, about three and a half thousand acres of state, about 50 miles south of London in Sussex. And they decided they weren't making much of a go of it as an arable, as a dairy farm. So let's introduce the kind of animals that existed in England 
500 years ago. Let's reintroduce bird species. Let's let it run wild. And it's become something of a success and it's now become a tourist site. You can go there, you can go glamping and see, or not aurochs because they haven't existed for 500 years, but you can see all sorts of strange looking animals that you don't normally see wandering um, about in the so meadows of Britain. So um, my final point is that many people condemn this, say artificial wilding should not be allowed. What happens here in America with abandoned farms is far better because if I look out of my window here, I can see farms that existed a hundred years ago, but yeah. now all the old animals are coming back because the farms have disappeared. But I sense that you're wanting to get questions and I should shut up. Yes, Simon, I, I'm getting, uh, there are only lots of questions and I think Shari's gonna, um, she's got access to them. So um, uh, let, let's, let's start. Okay, hi everyone. Thank you so much, Simon. This is fascinating. Um, so far, we just have a few questions, but people should feel free to add in any more in the chat and I'll read them. Um, but right now, um, someone would like to know your journalistic process. How do you, I mean, I think this applies basically to every book you've written. How do you devise a process that compiles such weighty topics into an accessible story? Um, well, um... I suppose, first of all, I impose a structure on it. I think that's the most important thing. I'm, at the moment, I'm doing a book on the history of the diffusion of knowledge, how the, the working title of the book is Knowing What We Know, a history of the diffusion of knowledge and the risks to the future of wisdom. The idea being that with knowledge being easily available, the, the press of a Google button, we don't keep it in our heads as we used to. And this poses, if you agree that wisdom is knowledge multiplied by experience, then if in the future we have very little knowledge, then no matter how old we are, we may not be wise. And I think humankind needs wisdom. So um, to look at a subject as big as this, you have to decide what are the major questions you want to ask uh, about this. So obviously, what is knowledge? How do people acquire it? And clearly education. How is it disseminated? And then that's newspapers and books and so forth. How is it stored? And that's encyclopedias and so forth. Um, ending, of course, in Wikipedia. And um, then what is wisdom? And who are the polymaths? And so that there are five basic areas that for this particular book I've identified. And at the moment, I'm looking quite specifically at education. What do children learn? When do they learn it? Oh. Uh, what do children learn in China that is different from children in Mombasa or in Ecuador or in Moscow? And what knowledge is common to all? Does do all children of 16 know, for instance, the value of pi and what pi is? Um, so these kind of questions um, are what sort of marinates in my mind at the moment. And I try and corral these, the answers to these questions into these five main subject areas. Five is purely coincidental, though there happens to have been five areas for the land book. There were seven, I think, in the book I did on the Atlantic Ocean. So um, it has to be, I must say, a matter of organization. And if I've left something out, then that becomes a big problem. And so the the creation of the structure is crucially important to me because once I've got the structure, then the book itself, I won't say organizes itself, but is relatively more easy to do. Okay, thank you so much for that. And that actually answers the other uh, question that we had, which was what is next on your list of things that you're working on? <laughs> well, that's it, knowing what we know. Um, Delivery date, 31st of December, 2022. So I've got a little little time to think about it. Although annoyingly, I shouldn't be annoyed by this at all, but I was invited the other day to give a lecture on board the Queen Mary II on a trip from New York to Southampton. And then they fly me back again, just before Christmas, 2022. And I, part of me wants to say, but I've, I've got a deadline. I've got to finish this book. Why am I going to turn down a trip? 
Right. So um, I may have to ask the publisher for a two week extension, but I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. Yeah, I mean, turning down a trip for most people is difficult, but particularly for you. <laughs> well, and particularly after COVID as well. Yes, I mean, we all exactly. Kind of that's so, true, that's true. Yeah. Um, another question um, about this book specifically, um, it, the writer wrote, this is a huge and fascinating topic and I can't wait to get the book. <laughs> However, I was wondering how you decided on what to focus on in the book and what are you hoping that your readers will feel and understand about land? Well, that's a, that's a wonderful question. Although in a way, I suppose, I, I said there were five areas. And so the first one is, first of all, there's a long prologue in which I discuss my land, the land that we were talking about just now. And there's an epilogue in which it sort of sums up everything, but there's a wonderful, wonderful story uh, by Tolstoy called How Much Land Does a Man Need? And so I retell that story, which some people will know, but I think most people don't. And it's such a charming story and it sort of sums up what this book is all about. But then between the bookends, if you like, of the prologue and the epilogue, there are these five subject areas. The first one, which is dearest of all to my heart, is to do with surveying and mapping because I adore maps and atlases and that sort of thing. And um, then, so in other words, where is the land? In order to own land, you need to know where it is. And um, then how do you acquire land? You steal it, borrow it, or as in the case of slave land, you acquire it after it's been created for you out of the sea. And then once you've got it, um, do you fight over it? Do you fight, you know, what wars and disputes have resulted in the relationship with your neighbors? And then how do you steward it? And of course, there's an awful lot of thought, particularly these days, about how one should not be careless of uh, the way you look after this land. And I use as one of the examples, the fact that most of the big cities in America have a beltway around them, a road like the Capitol Beltway in Washington, DC, but not so Denver, Colorado. And that has a big slice taken out of it, looks like a in the Northwest on the Rocky Mountain side of Denver, there's a gap. And the reason for that is that the land there is horribly polluted with plutonium because there was the so-called Rocky Flats plant, which was assembled triggers for nuclear bombs for until fairly recently, until the late 1990s. And that has left a legacy which demonstrates how badly humankind has in many, many cases superintended the land. And then I talk about um, in the fifth chapter, community ownership, the kind of thing we were talking about here in um, Cornwall and Dutchess County, New York, but particularly in my case, because I'm so interested in the islands of Western Scotland, where I used to live and where I did a lot of my geology field work, and particularly the islands of Ulva and Egg, which uh, had I got longer to talk about, I would read you a chunk from the chapter on Egg. But um, that is the way I've organized the book. And I hope from each chapter, someone will take something amusing and in interesting and with any luck enlightening away from it. Thank you. Um, another question is, um, someone is very interested to hear more about your thoughts on how all Americans live on and dare to quote own stolen Indian land and what sorts of reparation schemes may be taking hold around the country. Well, I'm very, very glad. And, and I, I should point out that I dedicated the book um, instead of, you know, to my mother or someone like that, to this fellow, the standing bear, who's a punker, Indian from what used to be Nebraska. Um, the decision in 1879 by the US Supreme Court, which finally declared him to be a human being, because up to that point, Native Americans were not really regarded as humans. So he was declared to be a human being entitled to civil rights, but still they took away his land anyway. And this whole saga of the confiscation of Indian lands and obviously in many cases savagely and trail of tears with the Indian tribes from the Southeast being driven to Oklahoma. The whole question of the Oklahoma land run. I used to live in Oklahoma when I was a teenager. So the 22nd of April, 1890, whatever it was, 1891, I think, um, the Oklahoma land run figures. 
And the whole business, yes, you're absolutely right, of compensation. Well, I'm hopeful, as indeed I think all people who are interested in this question are hopeful, that with the appointment of Deb Holland, who is from the Southwest Pueblo, people of um, New Mexico, Arizona rather, um, that um, there will be, some, as Secretary of the Interior, and that's therefore in charge of Indian policy, that there will be some movement in this regard. I mean, I still find it astonishing that the Mohicans who live in this part of the world no longer live in this part of the world. They live in Wisconsin of all places. And the displacement of Native Americans is a monstrous crime. In New Zealand, there has been movement, restorative justice to a growing extent, which began in the late 1970s. The Maoris, I don't want to gloss over it because it's a very, very complicated story, are in slowly, slowly, and in a significant number of cases, are getting their land back. It hasn't started to happen over the sea in Australia yet, and it's still a long way from happening in either Canada with the First Nation or with the Native Americans here in the United States. But New Zealand is a case that I think anyone interested in the situation of Native Americans should look at. And Deb Holland, I'm sure, is well aware reform is needed and it is beginning to happen. Um, thank you for that. Uh, there's a, another question. Um, did you include in your book the rewilding efforts being conducted in Chile and Patagonia and in Argentina and Brazil by the Tompkins Foundation? They have purchased millions of acres from private owners and donated it back to Chile as part of the national park system worth talking about, says the writer of this question. I absolutely agree. No, I did not, but I am aware of it. Um, not least because, as Jane very kindly mentioned at the beginning of this, I spent three months in prison in uh, Tierra del Fuego, <laughs> and I go back there quite often. So the Tompkins Foundation is doing wonderful things in, in Southern Patagonia, mainly, I think, on the Chilean side. Um, it is something worth exploring, but that is the problem with a book like this, what to leave out. And um, it's rather like not knowing when you've finished a, a painting. So the paperback is um, will come out in, when did this book come out? January the 19th. So next January, I'll have the opportunity to write more in a new preface. And I think that would be an admirable candidate. So thank you for reminding me. And I think it should be indeed included. So thank you. Um. And, and thank you. I think we're coming to the end of our time. Thank you, Simon, uh, for um, uh, uh, you know a wonderful uh, entree into your book. But I have to tell everybody, Simon has only scratched the surface, and you should all go out and buy his book. Um, uh, instructions are on the chat sister chat board for where you can get it locally. And I'm just very pleased that Cornwall just had a little bit to do. Uh, with your um, uh, with your settling in not quite not all that close to Cornwall now but fairly close so thank you and uh, uh, well I'm delighted and let me just say Jane I know this is a blatantly commercial thing to say but Ben who owns House of Books reminds me that all independent bookstores in America today are this is independent booksellers day and yes. I think all books are 10% off I can't believe I've ever said such a thing I sound like a, I'm hawking <laughs> books. I don't mean to, but I think it's well worth, if you order them today, 10% less than normal. Well, there you are. Uh, and on that commercial note, we should end. So thank you. Thank you both. Very, very much. It was fascinating. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Jane, also for all the work that you did to bring this event um, to us. And thank you everyone for joining today. We're so grateful to see so many faces here. And lastly, thank you again, Simon. Please keep churning these books out. They're amazing. <laughs> You're so sweet. Thank you both. Thank you, Jane, very much Thank indeed. You. Sorry. Thanks. Thank you. Take care, Bye -bye. everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.